Welcome everyone to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. I'm joined on this video chat by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our membership and administrative coordinator, Kelly Ross, is hosting the call and coordinating technology this morning. Our administrative and education directors, Gene Helms and Chelsea Krafka, are here this morning with readings. Several of us are present in the chat room running beside this YouTube video on Sunday morning. Bob Fusen, our music director, is here as well. And we have two lay pastoral care folks on, the, on call this morning, Jackie Egan and Carrie Schonard. So if you need someone to talk to today, reach out and we will get you in contact with one of the two of them. We're still practicing this new way of being together. And while it is a time of anxiety, this is also a time of possibility. We're going to learn a lot, fast, about how to be a church, both together and apart. Much has changed in the last month, but what has not changed is the vision of this church. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and to transform the world. That is a big vision. And we know that creating a loving community begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time joining this community or your 500th, if you have stumbled onto this YouTube video or this YouTube channel by accident, or if you are a longtime member trying to figure out how to log on, if you come here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here with us. More than ever, it's important that we share the warmth, love, and light of this place. So my ask to you this morning is simple. This community, do not keep it a hidden gem. Invite people here. One of the benefits of being online like this is we are actually not limited to Lincoln. So if you have family members spread out across the country in need of connection, point them here. If you have friends who are looking for a place to connect with you and with each other, point them to us. The business of the church now, in this moment, is connection. That's our first priority, that's our second priority, and that's our third priority. So if you have neighbors who need someone to talk to, remember that here we preach that all have worth and dignity and all are interconnected. Every tool we have as a church is going to be used to help people connect with each other during this time. And you have been doing this during the last two weeks. The response from the congregation as we face this pandemic has been nothing short of remarkable. From offering to start check-in groups, to trying out new ways of meeting, to selling chocolate or painted rocks online for the discretionary fund, to just calling each other to talk. The staff has also been working hard to put systems, systems to this work. So help us by continuing to make those connections yourself and reach out to us. As we enter into worship together, take a moment to center yourself wherever you are. Find a comfortable place in your body. Take a few deep breaths and let us begin. We begin worship in Unitarian Universalism by lighting a flaming chalice. We say that it represents the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. And the words that we light our chalice to this morning are adapted from the Reverend Gretchen Haley, who writes, cast your vision here, in the middle of the hardest moment, the turning of a new season, in this a new decade. This life with so much worth saving, this fragile faith, for the children born now into the world as it is, with the threat of war, economic calamity, and pandemic. Still, while the memory lingers of holidays chaotic and miraculous into this day, offer the vision you've tried to talk yourself down from. Your wildest dreams, your audacious aims, the beauty that whispers to you to follow and to build and to become for this world, 
coming undone by distraction and greed and fear, this world divided by made up borders, fake fights and all that needs forgiveness. Here, stir up your steadfast hope, your resolute clarity of what remains possible. Be generous with your dreaming and brave. All paths to the future are born in this courage of imagination, this willingness to shed, to salvage, to start again, to be this blessing for each other, to be this blessing. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn, once again, is The Meditation on Breathing by Sarah Dan Jones, played by Not Your Mama's Hymns.
Our first reading is by Unitarian Universalist Minister, Reverend Karen G. Johnston. Not just the what, but also the how. Wise ones say we can be good, good enough, and imperfect all at the same time. Wise ones say that we can listen to understand, not necessarily agree, and be moved by a truth that does not make sense to our lived experience and let it change our world. They tell us also to raise up those who are trodden upon, to cultivate humility when the world would rather we grow certitude in our hearts. Wise ones remind us we can recognize that those who do harm do not always intend to, and that it is still ours to reckon with the impact. They tell us that we can say, I don't know, and I'm not sure, and still be a warrior, still be whole, still be a leader. In fact, the kind of leader we long for. Wise ones tell us to pay attention to not just the what, but also the how. May this be the meditation of our hearts. May this be the words of our mouths. Not just the what, but also the how. May we be the wise ones today and every day. So it feels like a lifetime ago, but we started the month of March talking about wisdom. On March 1st, I preached about the wisdom of story, how we can take a relatively simple narrative and find almost infinite meanings and interpretations in it. And then a week later, I preached about the wisdom of data, how sometimes what we need is not a single story, but many stories aggregated together to give us a more universal picture. This part seems important now in the three weeks since March 8th. I think we've all in some ways become amateur epidemiologists, watching the data, parsing it, worrying about it. And we're doing our part now, being out of the building, basically because of a mathematical formula. Because what is flattening the curve other than listening to the wisdom of data? And through this, the wisdom of story remains. Because at some point, maybe some point relatively soon, we're going to start telling the story about the spring and summer of 2020. And right now, I don't think we know what that story will be and what meaning it will have, what wisdom we will remember from it. Will it be a story of collapse? How the institutions we depended on came apart under the stress of the moment? Or will it be a story of communities coming together physically distant, but never spiritually closer as we act collectively to protect and care for each other and the most vulnerable among us. The story might be a bit of both. The reality might be a bit of both. But how we tell it will determine what meaning our children take from this time. All this week and the last, we've been talking about what the role of the church is during a pandemic. Most years we have lots of goals as a church. I have a list from the beginning of this year and confirmed at the board retreat in February that lays out the goals of the 2019-2020 church year. Moving to two services, figuring out what our religious education needs are, looking at communications, revamping pastoral care. Those are all good. Those are all still things that we are working on. But for now, the first, second, third goal of this church is connecting, connecting, and connecting. How do we connect members to each other and to the church in this moment of physical isolation? There's lots of reasons that it's important that we do this. Practically to cut down on isolation, to make sure that our members are safe, 
that we need, meet practical needs that we hear about. It's also important because connection makes manifest the interconnected whole that we preach about. It's how we make tangible in the world the interconnected web of existence. Make that a real thing, not just a, a theological concept that we preach about. And we're also about connection because we have wisdom to offer one another. Because in this moment, we can be a strength for each other. Each one of us has something to offer. And each one of us in the next couple months is going to need help at some point or another. There's a story that's been going on recently. Remy Blumenfield uh, told it in, a, in an article published. It, it's an older story than this. It actually comes out of uh, my wife's field of medicine. But the way Remy Blumenfield tells it is this. Years ago, the anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected Mead to talk about clay pots, tools for hunting, grinding stones, or religious artifacts. But no. Mead said that the first evidence of civilization was a 15,000 year old fractured femur found at an archeological site. A femur is the longest bone in the body linking hip to knee. In societies without the benefits of modern medicine, it takes about six weeks of rest for a fractured femur to heal. This particular bone had been broken and had healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger. You cannot drink or hunt for food. Wounded in this way, you are meat for your predators. No creature survives a broken leg long enough for it to heal. So a broken femur that is healed is evidence then that another person has taken time to stay with the fallen, has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety and tended to them through the recovery. A healed femur indicates that someone has helped a fellow human rather than abandoning them to save their own life. This week, Blumenfield goes on I received a note from a woman who lives close to my parents, combined age of 166, now in isolation at their home in Grantchester. This woman, who I have met only once before, knew that I too was in self-isolation and could not, therefore, help my parents, so was offering to take care of them should they need it. I am happy to bike down and have a conversation through the door with them. I'm also happy if anything goes wrong to look after them. So use me and rest assured that if things go wrong, I will look after them as if they were my own parents. Whether or not they ultimately accept this offer, I feel hugely relieved to know not only that my mom and dad have someone nearby who can help out if necessary, but that such warm and generous neighbors exist. This love was there all along, of course, but the current crisis allows it to be seen. It makes me feel warmer, safer, and better about living to know that such altruism is close at hand. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts, Margaret Mead said. And never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can't change the world, for indeed, it's all it ever has. We have the wisdom to help each other through this, to be the wise ones for each other, to heal each other's broken femurs if they are literal or illness or brokenness of the heart and the soul. I know that's already happening in this congregation and much of what our role is going to be as an institution is going to be to facilitate 
those connections and that wisdom. Since 2017, Reverend Fre Susan Frederick Gray has been the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, of which this congregation is a part. Since considerably before then, she has been a pastor. And one of the hallmarks of her time at our denomination's headquarters has been the care that she's extended to professional staff across the country, reaching out to tell us, yes, she sees us, and yes, ministry in the second decade of the 21st century is really, really hard. And yes, we're in it together. A few days ago, she sent out the video we're about to play to congregations across the country to use in our online worship. It's a message to all of us and an update on our denomination, but also a kind of prayer. So the Red Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. Hello, dear ones. I'm Susan Frederick Gray, president of your Unitarian Universalist Association. And I'm coming to you from my home where I and all of us at the UUA are moving to virtual operations and working from home. As we navigate these incredibly difficult and uncertain times for our country and our global community, I want you to know that I am holding you and all of our congregations, our members, our leaders, our people in my heart. I pray that you are making time to tend to your own heart and your own spirit. Take gentle care of yourselves. It is really easy to feel overwhelmed or inadequate or caught in fear these days. With all of the anxiety, grief, and fear that is real in this time, I believe that pastoral care and connecting across physical distance will be ever more important. As you tend to your own community and to each other, remember to take time to slow down, to breathe, to lean into your mission as a community and to the needs of your community. There really is no script for these times and no one practice will work for all congregations. Leaning into mission, taking a time to slow down and think about what's most important can help guide you in this time. And remember that we're all learning here, trying new things and adapting as the news changes and conditions change. Perfection is never the goal. The goal is to care for one another and to live compassionately and mindful that we are in this together and that we are one human community and one you, you community. Know that your care and intention for one another really make a difference in this time, both to the people you know and love as well as for your own well being. I'm enormously grateful for all of you and your commitment to one another and to our wider faith. It's times like these when we feel how deeply important our living tradition is and how much we need one another. I love you all so much. I'm proud of the way that Unitarian Universalists are taking this situation seriously and responding out of deep care. I'm proud of the ways that we are putting compassion and community care at the forefront of all we do. I am with you all in this time. I too am finding my way bit by bit. As the weeks go on, our needs may change, but let us remember how important it is to be bound together in religious community connected to one another and offering both our care and our stories and sources of resilience and hope for this time. I love you all. Be well. Take good and gentle care of yourselves. Many blessings to each and every one of you.
as we join together in singing this next hymn, Spirit of Life, I want you to take a moment to think about what you bring to this time, to this place. What joys and sorrows are on your heart. And then as you are moved, as we listen and sing this next song together, type your name or the name of someone you're holding in care into the chat box beside the video. Let us begin. told by Avi Liren. During the festive Passover meal with his ministers, King Solomon teased Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, his arrogant chief of army. Benaiah, I was told that there's a special ring that has a special power. It can change the mood of a person. A sad person becomes happy when watching it and a happy person becomes sad. I know that you of all people in the kingdom can find the ring. Would you be able to find this ring and bring it to me until the eve of Sukkot, that is six months from now? 
Well, if it exists anywhere on earth, your majesty, I'll find it and I'll bring it to you, replied Benaiah. King Solomon smiled as he knew that no such ring existed, but he wanted to give his minister a taste of humility. Time passed and Benaiah sent soldiers and messengers throughout the kingdom, examined records, consulted with elders, yet he could not find even a hint of the existence of the magic ring. Spring passed, so did summer. The last harvest of the year and with it the Sukkoth festival was approaching. Then came the eve of Sukkot day. With only a few hours to go before the deadline, Benaiah was wandering the streets of Jerusalem. The sun was setting, casting a golden light on the city. All the merchants were busy with the last sale and prepared to close their stalls. In desperation, he turned to an old silversmith. Have you by any chance heard of a magic ring that makes the happy person forget his joy and the broken-hearted person forget his sorrows? asked Benaiah. The silversmith listened carefully and smiled. He took a plain silver ring from his old and dusty box and engraved something on it. When Benaiah read the words on the ring, his face lit up as he knew he had found the right ring. This is the ring, he cried, and gave the poor jeweler all the money in his purse. Come to the palace and you shall have more, he added, for I cannot thank you enough. The sun had set. The time for the holiday dinner arrived. That night, the palace was full of guests ready to celebrate with the king. Well, my friend, said Solomon, have you found a ring that can make a happy man sad and a sad man happy? Everyone who knew about the search for the impossible ring laughed and Solomon himself smiled. But to everyone's surprise, Benaiah held up a ring and declared, here it is, your majesty, I found a ring. It has three Hebrew letters engraved on it. Gimel, Zin, Yod. Then he whispered the meaning of these initials in the king's ear. As soon as Solomon heard the meaning of the inscription, the smile vanished from his face. He looked at the guests filling the banquet hall, the tables covered with shining serving pieces, silver goblets, and the finest food one can find, and tears rolled down his eyes. He felt sad. The entire hall was in total silence. A ring that makes the king cry? Then King Solomon looked at the ring again and started to smile again, then laughed so hard, infecting the entire palace with giggles and laughter. Everyone wanted to know the meaning of the initials. The king revealed to his guests what was written on the ring. The three letters represented three words, gam, za, ya, avor. It means in English, this too shall pass. It feels a little early to say about the COVID-19 pandemic, this too shall pass. Because the truth is we're only beginning to understand how this may change us, how we may respond, what we may do over the next months. It will pass, all things do, the sun also rises. But what we can't do right now is expect it to pass at a certain date or time or before it becomes too inconvenient for us. That is not the nature of viruses. And to try and change that is like trying to change the path of a tornado. But within this new normal, though, all things are impermanent. Everything passes. I'm thinking on a smaller scale than the pandemic. Difficult Zoom calls uncertainty about employment, a tantrum thrown by a two-year-old who really, really wants to watch Frozen for the fourth time in three days. These, these things too shall pass. This is a place to find wisdom in the coming week. Try it on. See if it brings you comfort. In the midst of whatever tempest you find yourself in, look down and whisper, this too shall pass. We have just a few announcements as we move towards the end of our time together. We're, we've been working this week 
on starting up new opportunities to connect and check in with each other. So watch your daily email updates and videos for more information about that. A lot of the stuff happening behind the scenes right now is really exciting. I do want to talk for a little bit about uh, a, a scam that's going around to the congregation. Scams are always a part of church life. Um, they have become a particular part of church life in the midst of this pandemic. Folks in, uh, pretend to be clergy using the name of um, serving clergy and email the congregation asking for gift cards to help folks in the hospital. There's one of these going around right now. In fact, we've had several a week since this started, purporting to be from me and asking for you, the congregation, to buy gift cards to support people in the hospital. So let me be absolutely crystal clear in this setting and in every setting, I will never, ever, and nobody from the church ever will ask you for gift cards. If you have a request to buy gift cards and send money, that is a scam. Please don't send gift cards over email. The only way, the only way that the church currently asks for money is through regular pledging and through donations to the church's discretionary fund that go through our Realm online giving software. That allows us to track it, make sure it's legitimate, and provides a level of fraud protection. I will never ask for you to give money outside of those channels. That's it. Those are the only two ways. If you have questions, if you have an email that you have concerns about, please reach out to us. We've had several people fall victim to this scam. So please do not buy gift cards. If something feels off, call me or another member of the church staff. We will talk you through it. We will probably tell you it's a scam. We will probably tell you that we've already gotten several calls about it that day. But we can confirm whether or not anything that you get from us is actually from us. This is going to sound like a digression, but there was a, a learned theological debate in the 19th century among universalists uh, between ultra-universalists and restorationists. And the ultra-universalists believed that as soon as you died, you would uh, go to, everybody would go to heaven, everybody would be saved immediately. And the restorationists believed that if you, if you sinned considerably in your lifetime, you would face a period of punishment, but not eternal punishment. Um, before before you went to heaven. Um, I have always thought that if I was in the mid 19th century, I would be an ultra universalist. Um, but the fact that these scammers are taking advantage of the congregation in this particular moment uh, has, has me thinking more about the restorationist side that you know, eternal punishment is not what we're about, but there are some things that are deeply, deeply wrong. The last announcement, um, is that uh, Thursday night worship is now a weekly thing. We are no longer doing it on the third Thursday. We are doing it every Thursday. Uh, we're doing it on Zoom. Um, this week we had, uh, I think, over 60 people there. By my count, we had about 55 screens at any given time, uh, but many of those screens had multiple people. So a big part of our congregation is gathering each week on Thursday night over Zoom. Um, it's a great chance to connect with each other, to see each other, and share some time um, really digging into to questions with each other. Um, the link to that on Zoom will be in your e-blasts, in your emails from us, uh, and I hope to see you there on Thursday. So we'll close our time together with one more hymn, We Give Thanks. It's precious to have time to be together to see the sun in the sky and to join in song. So please, uh, wherever you are, rise in body or in spirit and join in singing, we give thanks. <laughs>
So thank you to the staff of, Uni of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln for helping put this together. Thanks as well again uh, to Sarah Jebian and Laura Weiss and their band Unfolding for the permission to use their music in our uh, videos. We close our time by extinguishing this chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds.